Hello and welcome to the Book View series of the Sunday Magazine. I'm your host, Medha Datta Yadav, and we have with us today American Indologist and Sanskrit scholar, Wendy Doniger. Welcome, Wendy. I'm glad to be here. So today we discuss her latest book, Winged Stallions and Wicked Mares, Horses in Indian Myth and History. So the subject is, uh, I read somewhere that you have always loved horses from your childhood. So the subject must be very, very close to your heart. So tell us more about it. Well, I always loved horses. I became a serious rider when I was about 25. Um, mm -hmm. It started when I went to India, where I met in India an English woman who taught me to ride at the age of 25. Okay. And I've had horses ever since then until I got too old to ride as I am now. But horses kept coming into my books in small versions. I had horses in the Rig Veda, horses and other books I'd written. But it wasn't until I retired and started writing books that were more personal. I wrote a book about my parents and so forth that I decided to write, put together all the references to horses in all my other books and to do some more consistent thinking about it and really look at the whole history of horses in India and it's a book um, about the difference between people who love horses and people who don't love horses. And there are both kinds in India. And my mm -hmm. own love of horses is what made me to uh, think about it that way and to tell the difference between the stories of the Rajputs who knew and loved their horses and the stories from parts of South India where no one ever had a horse and mm -hmm. horses seem weird to them. And they're different stories depending on whether you really love horses or don't. Okay, so uh, when we talk of Indian mythology, generally, I mean, animals are not just animals. There's always some another aspect to them. It's not, I mean, a horse is not just a horse. Horse is a never cow, just a cow. A cow is not just a cow. That's right. So, That's right. yeah, so why, why do you think, uh, I mean, why is that so? I think that, well, animals are like people, but they're more so. And so we project onto them a kind of suddenly exposed vision of a particular aspect of human nature. We strip away all the complications that make us humans. So owls are wise and dogs are loyal and lions are royal and all that sort of thing. And I think because people have depended on, on horses for such a long time, have used them and have been so intimate with them, perhaps more intimate than any other animal with them, maybe the exception of dogs. And you ride horses, you, you, your body is right in contact with their body and they're symbols of power. We think of horse power, um, yeah. everything. So they have these meanings and they become um, symbolic of power. And then the idea of harnessing a horse is part of yoga. The, the word yoke, to yoke a horse is the same word as yoga. Yoga means to okay. gather yourself up the same way you pull on a horse's reins, you rein yourself in. So it's a basic metaphor for that important aspect of Indian philosophy. And so horses also symbolize speed and flight, flight in the sense of running away. You know, horses have their eyes in the back of their heads. Yeah, yeah. Those means they're running away animals as opposed to cats that have their eyes in the front where they're always hunting yeah. something else. So horses think they're deer. We may think that they're tigers, but they act as if they think they're deer. And then you have the sexual meaning, the stallions with their virility and all of that, and the mares with their skittishness and the mares have a bad press in Indian mythology. So, yes, so they yes. take on meanings that we project onto them because they're such beautiful, powerful animals. They just capture the imagination, they always do. So uh, I'm sure when you started writing the book, uh, there was a lot of research to be done and you delve into a lot of stories and you probably spoke to a lot of people also and there were a lot of folk tales. So what was that maybe uh, some very odd or unexpected story about a horse that you know that you came across while writing and it stuck with you and you were like, wow, I mean, how could this happen? Yeah. I, I had a lot of familiar stories and I met a lot of new stories. When I actually, I thought I knew all about horses in India. I did not. Mm -hmm. um, I had to do a lot of work to write the book. And I came across a set of stories from South India. So 
South India is not a good place to raise horses. The great horses in India come from the Punjab and from Rajasthan. Um, the, the, Indian, the horses in South India had to be imported and the, no farmers ever had horses in South India. They had bullocks, they had elephants if they could and so forth. So this South Indian story is a story about horses that in the night turn into jackals and eat up all the other horses in the stable. Now, if you know horses, you know, it's not a good thing to be bitten by a horse, but it's yeah. not as bad as being bitten by a dog. They don't have mm -hmm. sharp teeth. You, mm -hmm. they, they, they crush your hand. It's like getting your hand caught in the door or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But to be kicked by a horse, can, you can be killed. So if yeah. you have a horse you don't trust, you stay by its head, you stay away from its back end. But people who don't know about horses say, oh, they have these big teeth, this big head. So this is a story about the danger that comes from the horse's mouth. They gobble up the other horses, which is insane. Horses don't behave like that. So it wasn't a story of people who loved horses. But in this story, the god Shiva turns the horses into jackals to save the life of his devotee who's being persecuted by the king. And then Shiva takes the form of a Muslim horseman to come and save his devotee. So that really surprised me. Now, a lot of Hindus and Muslims do unite in the worship of horses, particularly, but not only in Maharashtra, where the Khandoba cult is celebrated by Muslims and Hindus together. But to see Shiva as a Muslim and in a positive aspect, was a clue to the many myths in which Muslims take on a very positive role in stories by Hindus about horses because they brought the Arabian horses into India and mm. those are the best horses. And so people were really grateful to the Muslims, whatever political problems there were on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, it's not really, when you, when you learn about it, not surprising as it seemed at first that even the god Shiva should take the form of a Muslim horseman. But let me tell you, I was surprised at first. Okay. So just like uh, you always grew up, I mean, uh, you grew up with a love of horses. I grew up uh, with a love for dogs. Now, oh. at one point in time, I had 14 dogs. Oh, so, my. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, so and naturally there were also these uh, stories uh, from our mythology like uh, the dog uh, accompanying Yudhishthir finally towards when he reaches heaven it's only the dog who finally is there That's because right. the, the most loyal co company then of course in Bhimbetka there's the there are the dog paintings on the wall by yes carved by early men. So do we see you, uh, you know, maybe delving into another book on, let's say, dogs? Someday I may write a book about dogs, but that episode that you mentioned is mm -hmm. the key to the book that I'm just finishing up now, which is okay. also going to be uh, published in India, probably in December or January, also by, by Ravi Singh, by Speaking Tiger, my publisher, the one who's publishing the horse book because it's a, I've done a translation of the last four books of the Mahabharata, which have mm -hmm. never been really properly translated. It's what happens, it's called after the war. It's what happens to the Pandavas and indeed the Kauravas when everyone is dead and they're feeling terrible and then they have a vision and they go to heaven and they go to hell and everything. Yeah. And the key is that dog and the dog that follows you just here. And it's a test, it's his last moral test because yes. he gets to the gates of heaven and Indra comes and says, come in and, uh, but leave the dog. And mm -hmm. it just, what do you mean leave the dog? This dog is my bhakta. And the word didn't mean then as much as it meant later on with you have a Krishna bhakta, but it meant someone who is devoted to me, who loves me. Mm -hmm. And uh, Indra says, you can't bring the dog to heaven. If you bring the dog with you, you can't go to heaven. And Indra said, in that case, uh, Yudhishthira says, in that case, I'm not coming to heaven. And the dog then transforms himself into Dharma, the incarnation of Dharma, Yudhishthira's father. And he said, that was the last test. You did the right thing. And so Yudhishthira then goes into heaven. So it's an interesting story because the rule that dogs can't go into heaven 
which is really a rule about Dalits going into temples. It's a yeah. rule about caste. It's really a book of caste. No dog ever does go to heaven. Mm -hmm. So Yudhishthira says, I'll take the dog to heaven, but he doesn't because there's no dog. So on the one hand, it proves that he's a good person. It's his final test. But on the other hand, it says, no dogs go to heaven. So it's a wonderful Mahabharata story that has its cake and eats it in a way. It makes one moral point and at the same time preserves the old fashioned Hindu view of um, pollution really, and of uh, what it is to be literally untouchable. So it's a wonderful story. So that's the high point of the book that I, that I just finished. And maybe someday I'll write a book about only about dogs. I, I love dogs. <laughs> okay. And uh, this brings me to my final question. And it, it just suddenly uh, popped up in my head that uh, no, in many countries, like in Egypt, for example, no, there were cats. No. Yep. So the cats were the feline, it was always the feline form which was actually worshipped or people uh, really, I mean, uh, you know, paid obeisance to them, drew the feline form. So why is it that, you know, in different uh, parts of the world, you have a different animal coming up? That's true. Um, it's partly um, how you use them. Um, the cats were used to control the rats. Cats in India, see, um, uh, there's a famous statue down in Mahabalipuram of, mm -hmm. uh, of a cat ascetic. He's meditating in, in an asana. And meanwhile, he's looking for the mice. He's going to eat the mice. He persuades <laughs> them that he's, that he's a vegetarian, but he's not. Um, so it's partly the animals that you have and that you use. Um, because of Hindus' ideas of cleanliness and the importance of eating carefully, the dog, which is an omnivore, a scavenger, is obviously never going to be acceptable to Hindus in the same way. And indeed, cats are also omnivores and have mm -hmm. never been deified. Um, the cat um, in India is the uh, vahana, uh, the vehicle of the goddess of childbirth, Shashti, the goddess of the sixth day. Yeah. She has a cat. So cats are regarded as feminine and, and, and therefore that's the one acceptable cat, which is the, 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 the cat of, of childbirth. Otherwise, cats have a very poor press in, in classical uh, Hindu mythology, I'm afraid, and so do dogs. It's horses and cows that are the big, the big players in uh, Hindu mythology. But I, I think cats have actually won the game because I own three Persian cats and they rule the house. We are the, I mean, uh, yeah, we are the slaves. So <laughs> Hindus, uh, my, my friend, I was, just was finished talking with my friend Sudhya Kakar, who has a, a German shepherd that runs freely mm -hmm. in his house. No, um, in India, people do have dogs as, as pets mm -hmm. now, but in the classical texts, um, they were guards. There's actually a very good dog in the Rig Veda, Sarama. Um, she is the bitch of Indra. And she goes ahead and she finds the path for them. And the enemies of the, the people who are the Vedic Indians try to seduce her, but she's clever and she resists them. And she saves the cows and brings the cows down. So there's a very positive female dog in the Rig Veda. If I ever do write that book, I will put Indra's bitch Sarama in. There's a hymn to her. She's, she's a very good person. She appears also in the Mahabharata later on. Sarama mm -hmm. appears. Her sons, the dogs, come to her complaining. They said, we went to the sacrifice of Janamejaya. We didn't touch anything and they threw stones at us. They said we had this spoiled the This is the story. I, I know this part of the story. That's right. Yeah. And so as a result, Janamejaya is cursed to get into serious trouble with other animals yeah. who turn out to be snakes. Yeah, yeah. So you have a dog in the beginning of the Mahabharata starting the curse of Janamejaya that begins the whole story. And then you have a dog at the end of the Mahabharata being the final test of Yudhishthira. So dogs are important people. Dogs are important people. Yes, they are. Okay, Wendy, thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out today. And Thank this was a wonderful question. conversation. This was a yeah. really, really good conversation. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you.